All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Rafael Medina subspecialty virtual morning report. My name is Maddie, and I'll be facilitating the session today. The topic of today's session is hematology, and I am so thrilled uh, for the session because we have two phenomenal educators to learn from today. We have Dr. Aaron Goodman, who will be the case discussant, and he's a hematologist at UC San Diego and is, you know, so much more. He's really a phenomenal educator, also known as Papa Heme on Twitter and all of his online educational resources. So we're really um, thrilled, Aaron, that you're joining us today and thrilled to learn from you. Um, and before discussing our phenomenal case presenter, Aaron, maybe you can unmute and just share a little bit about um, how you developed a passion for hematology. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I like getting to do these. I get to meet trainees right from all over the world are hopefully logged in. So, um, well, uh, I, I just think what we do, I the two minute backstory, I was going to do critical care medicine is what I wanted to do. And then in uh, residency, uh, the chief resident, there was a BMT service, bone marrow transplant service, and no one wanted to, they needed someone to do it. So I did it for four weeks. And that's just when CAR T's were starting to be studied in clinical trial and when I learned about that, I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world because I thought it was science fiction uh, that you could do manipulate the immune system to to cure patients who would otherwise die. And that from that day forward, I've been hooked. And the the uh, a malignant heme, and then even classical heme, the the fact that um, you know it's like diagnostic puzzles and, and uh, all these cases. And uh, I'm on a day to day when I'm in my clinic, every patient seems interesting to me. It's just the greatest field. So um, I'm glad that uh, people are also interested in hematology oncology. Hopefully. Uh, uh, right. This is residence fellows, or is this everyone? What? What? Who am I speaking it's to? Everyone. We have a range from medical students, residents, fellows, attending. So really, the the whole spectrum here. Interested yeah, no, in hematology. Just, uh, I mean, yeah. Everyone <laughs> says their feels best, but it is. A re I don't regret my decision uh, 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 at all. I mean, I sit in clinic, and it's interesting, rewarding, and uh, um, it's a great job. So. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. And the case presenter we have is Gabriel Alesho, who is a, a Heme Onc fellow at UPenn. So Gabriel, thank you so much for presenting the case today. And we'd love to hear from you as well. What drew you to hematology? Hi, well, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really glad. And um well, hematology, I, I mean, hematology and oncology, I think it's since I developed my interest to come into medicine, which was a little later in my life, but I always was fascinated with everything that we can do and how we can um, like fight cancer with the new drugs and the new developments and how everything has changed um, since 2013, when I started medical school. Um, yeah, and now going into fellowship, I every day I am so happy and so uh, like basically like enchanted with everything that I see. Obviously, there are the sad parts, but I think the good parts are worthy. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for presenting the case today. So we have a lot to get through. So why don't we jump right into it? Um, Gia, thank you for scribing the case. You can go ahead and share your screen. Uh, and Gabriel, the mic is to you for the first Alquat. All righty. Thank you very much. So this is actually a case we saw um, here and um, uh, with some caveats. It's a 50-year-old uh, gentleman with the only past medical history of obesity uh, who underwent a st uh, status post-sleeve gastrectomy about three or four years ago, came to the ER with uh, some chest pain, some um, like fatigue for some month, for like two or three months, and... Um, um yeah and like occasional fevers that were like in the 100 and 100.5 uh at night um she 
also said that chronically she had some normal cytic anemia, uh, but we didn't have like any like um, anything from like PCP because she didn't like to follow with them. Um, so that's pretty much the one liner that I have. Now, yeah. yep. No, keep going, keep going. Sorry to interrupt. Now, upon arrival, uh, obviously we asked her a little bit more questions if she had like blood in the stool um, and she denied that. Um, interestingly, um, just for, uh, for, so do I need to say anything else about, or I can tell a little bit of what we found in the ED um, regarding yeah. to her labs, which, which is the important part right now. Um, yeah, well, was, yeah. Oh, maybe we can um, pause here before we get more into the labs. And of course, we, we know we'll get a lot more information, but Aaron, maybe it's, um, it would be an interesting place to pause here. And, you know, we have this, this young gentleman coming in who we know, no, no, you know, chronically 50, has not 50. Oh, 50. 50. I, okay. 15. 50. That makes a little bit more sense. <laughs> 50 yeah. year old man. Um, is it a man or a female? It's a man. Man. Okay. Yeah. All right. We have the sex and um, age, right? <laughs> um, but maybe we, Aaron, would love to just hear how you think about, you know, normocytic anemia in, um, you know, a middle-aged man and what, how you think of the differential and um, how do you think about that? Yeah, I was, it's good. I mean, you're not going to ask me about the chest pain. So, uh, <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, normal cytic anemia, you know, you think uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, um, I mean, so first, whenever you see an anemia, uh, the first division point is, is it a proliferative anemia or a hypoproliferative anemia? So uh, does the bone marrow work? Uh, uh, is it is it making, is it able to make red blood cells or does the bone marrow not work for the 10 billion causes? And, and basically, if the bone marrow is working, you'll see a, a reticulocyte count corrected for the reticulocyte index, which takes into account the degree of anemia. And then there's something called the maturation time, which uh, the more anemic you are, the faster the things come out of your bone marrow. So you can look that up. I won't bore to death. But basically, if it's if it's compensating the reticulocyte counter indexes where it should be, then it's a destructive uh, uh, issue. And destruction uh, 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 is either due to uh, uh, due to uh, immune or non-immune mediated causes. So a Coombs test and those. Uh, types of anemias can also be normal cytic, although in a lot of them, they'll actually be macro cytic because the reticulocytes are big. I'm going to actually assume that this is not going to be one of those cases, although it could be because that would be a more unusual cause of a normal cytic anemia. Uh, but once, if it's a hypoproliferative uh, 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 anemia, meaning the reticulocyte count is, is low, uh, um, you know, you divide by MCV. Uh, the more I do this, though, some things that are low MCV or some things that are high MCV, you can sometimes see them uh, uh, in, in the middle with a normal cytic anemia. Uh, uh, but typically, uh, uh, normal cytic, so chronic kidney disease, uh, bone marrow disorders from replacement from uh, cancers, infections, uh, 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 primary bone marrow disorders, including uh, leukemias and myelodysplastic disorders. Typically, there would be other features. It would be unusual for those to present with isolated anemias, although MDS can, although those are typically sometimes more macrocytic. Uh, medications can do it. And then blood loss, at least in the acute phase, but when it's chronic, you end up being iron deficient. In this particular individual, they've had a gastrectomy uh, or a sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, um, and you definitely worry about... Um, um, vitamin type deficiencies, even iron deficiencies in patients who've had part of their stomach taken out, right? They don't make enough acid. Uh, you can have trouble absorbing iron, B12, all sorts of things. So that those would be on my differential. Ah, you know, to, then uh, uh, I'm trying to think of other stuff that would be curveballs. Uh, um, myeloma uh, can present with a, a, macro, a normal acidic to macrocytic anemia, but we would have other clues. So still kind of a broad differential. Basically, I want to see a CBC, look at the blood smear. And is this an isolated anemia or is this an anemia uh, with coexisting cytopenias? Incredible. All right, Gabriel, back to you. All righty, cool. Well, um, in the ED, uh, I can tell a little bit about her vitals uh, and uh, how, how she, she presented. So her temperature was... Uh, 99 
her heart rate uh, was uh, 100, her blood pressure was like uh, 110 over 20, over 85. Uh, her heart rate, uh, her respiratory rate was like 25. Um, really nothing in her uh, uh, physical examination was pretty much unremarkable. Um, um, and uh, the thing that was uh, interesting during our investigation was her labs that we got, uh, which basically showed uh, in a hematology part, uh, a hemoglobin of 4.8 with an MCV of 87, an RDW of 18, uh, white blood cells of 3.6, which is mildly low, with an ANC of 1,600, and platelets of 64. Other labs, she had an AKI with uh, a creatinine of 2.1 from a baseline 0 0.8. Um, her LFTs were all normal. So at that time, they immediately called hematology. And here I let Aaron say or make some comments. Yeah, I mean. Okay, so and the patient's clearly profoundly anemic and, right, her vital signs are not so bad, right? So this is fairly chronic, right? She'd be dropped over dead if this happened in a day. So uh, um, this has been going on at least for uh, uh, some time. Uh, probably on the order of months, uh, 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 given, and right, she walked in feeling okay. Um, and so you also see, uh, technically, I, I usually call neutropenia less than 1500, but it's it's approaching that, and there's some leukopenia, and then she's thrombocytopenic. So, um, you know, I'll get a retic, I mean, that would clearly, I want to see a reticulocyte I'm, I'm suspecting uh, in, in this case, it's going to be low, and there's some primary uh, bone marrow disorder. Can we just, we'll go in order. I mean, the, the, the first thing, what, what is the reticulocyte count? Um, the reticulocyte count was in like in the normal, uh, yeah, okay. in the lower range. I'm sorry, yeah, so in the lower so range. Okay, so she has a primary bone marrow disorder. Uh, and you can, you know, honestly, I'm not going to need much labs here. I mean, this this type of patient usually requires a bone marrow biopsy, uh, unless it was some profound uh, uh, vitamin deficiency. Uh, uh, um, and right, it could be kind of a mixed picture, right? She could have B12 and iron deficiency. So two things kind of contributing to this picture, although you wouldn't really suspect the iron deficiency to cause her platelets to be low. But I guess with severe B12 deficiency, I think maybe it could cause a, 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 a pancytopenia. Um, you know, with also with these gastric bypass, I mean, I'm using that clue of that, and that might all be a red herring, but I'm trying to think outside the box here. Uh, sometimes you can see copper uh, deficiency uh, in patients post gastric bypass, especially if they've taken a lot of zinc to to uh, help with wound healing or whatever ails them. People like taking zinc; it makes them feel good inside their brain. Um, but uh, you know, I'd also be worried in this individual about aplastic anemia. Uh, it wouldn't actually be a severe aplastic anemia yet, because her neutrophils. Uh, 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 not so bad, but I'd worry about aplastic anemia. And when I say aplastic anemia, uh, right, there's three flavors of aplastic anemia. There is true immune mediated aplastic anemia, which is, I think, the thing we are all thinking of. And then there is inherited aplastic anemias, which I would not suspect in a 50 year old with no family history, although you haven't told me any of that. Uh, you've left that out. So I'm assuming that's not pertinent. And she's at a fairly older age. Uh, but the inherited ones like Fanconi's, I don't want to go, there's a gazillion of them. And then there are secondary plastic anemias from toxins, uh, for anywhere from alcohol to drugs to, to viral infections, including hepatitis, Notice most notably hepatitis C. So, you know, and, and then uh, whether she has, uh, 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 you know, some sort of myeloid neoplasm, including MDS or aplastic anemia, right? She could have acute leukemia. You don't need to have a high white blood cell count to have acute leukemia. Uh, um, so those would be my, my, my differential. I mean, I, it'd be weird if she has some marrow replacing disorder from some other cancer or lymphoma, uh, uh, um, but we'll find that out. So she needs a marrow lab, lab wise. All I would get in this individual, um, besides looking at a blood smear, uh, um, I would get hepatitis serologies, 
an HIV. Um, I would get uh, a B12 iron uh, in, in folic acid. I probably wouldn't get much more labs other than than that. Uh, uh, um, that that's probably all I would get. Uh, um, I um, I wouldn't get. I mean, parvo would be weird to parvo is usually an anemia and it's usually in someone with other, some other problem to do that. A healthy person shouldn't get pancytopenia from parvovirus. So I wouldn't, I, I would just get what I told you. So let's get some of that stuff. Okay, cool. And so, sorry to, I sorry to interrupt. Level, you know, but yeah. Before yeah, we'll we jump to the next output, I just want to ask a quick question. Um, with the history of the sleeve gastrectomy, you talked about how maybe a component, there's potentially a component of vitamin deficiencies. And I would love for you to, um, you know, for all the learners listening, could you go through a bit how certain vitamin deficiencies would affect the CBC, whether that's, you know, iron, B12, copper, and if, you know, the RDW helps you or not? Yes. Um, I'm going to dig back to my classical heme brain. So, um, right. So the, the, the nutrition nutrient deficiency, so iron deficiency, we'll, we'll start with that. And, you know, typically with iron deficiency, right, it's from chronic blood loss uh, uh, in young females or for menstrual loss or in older individuals from GI bleeding of a gazillion causes. But you could also have a problem. And again, uh, you could also not take enough iron. Although that's unusual, but you, it, you can see absorption issues. And you typically see absorption issues um, in you know, uh, uh, classically like Crohn's disease where their terminal ileum screwed up and they're bleeding and they can't absorb a lot of it. And you can see uh, 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 absorption issues in gastrectomy patients from uh, uh, problems acidifying uh, uh, the GI secretions. And you would typically see a very, a, a low MCV. That would be a microcytic anemia, a classically iron deficiency anemia. And then other deficiencies, so B12 and folic, specifically B12, Right, you need intrinsic factor uh, to absorb uh, B12. An intrinsic factor is made in the parietal cells in the stomach. Uh, so if you're missing a lot of stomach, you're missing a lot of parietal cells. And then the intrinsic factor binds the B12 and then goes to your terminal ileum and you can't absorb it. So, uh, and you typically see a macrocytic megaloblastic. And macrocytic just means big, megaloblastic means. There's problems with the, uh, there's nuclear uh, cytoplasmic desynchrony, like you can't divide the cell right, so the nucleus gets all screwed up. Megablastic anemias are macrocytic, but not all macrocytic anemias are megaloblastic. Like just, you know, if you drink a lot of alcohol and don't get iron, def and don't get uh, nutrient deficient, you can see macrocytic changes, but not necessarily megaloblastic. But B12 is macrocytic and megaloblastic. Uh, uh, um, so, and then other deficiencies, you know, those are the two main ones, folic acid, uh, uh, um, although that's not as common with uh, 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 gastrectomy patients, zinc, zinc uh, excuse me, copper deficiency um, can really present, to my knowledge, with a, no a normal MCV. Uh, uh, I, I think to possibly high. It's not usually microcytic, and it's very unusual to see copper uh, deficiency. Um, you can't see it in bariatric patients. Uh, bariatric surgery patients. And then, as I said earlier, people who take a lot of zinc, zinc interferes with um, uh, copper absorption. And the one thing about copper deficiency, it can really look a lot like myelodysplastic syndrome uh, under the microscope. So like the classic case is like a bariatric patient taking a bunch of zinc, pancytopenia, they get a marrow and it shows all this dysplasia and they get a diagnosis of MDS, but the cytogenetics show no chromosome abnormalities. You get an NGS, there's no uh, mutation. So you don't see any markers of clonality other than ugly looking uh, uh, myeloid cells. And then you check a copper and it's low. I've actually been referred those to my transplant clinic. So you save the day. It's rare to find, uh, but just catching one was enough for me to check copper. I mean, if anyone has MDS with no cytogenetic abnormalities or NGS, you need to scratch your head and look for something else because that would be incredibly un unusual. Um, I think I covered most of the main uh, 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 vitamins and uh, uh, nutrients, uh, uh, but that's how I think about those. All you know is when you see g any uh, question stem with a gastrectomy, they, they can get all this stuff screwed up. So it's just something to keep in mind. Amazing teaching. Thank you. All right, Gabriel, back to you. All righty. So, I mean, answering to all those points, uh, HIV was negative. Uh, hepatitis serologies were all normal. B12 was in the 500. Um, 
the iron panel uh, showed like just an elevation in a TIBC uh, with a ferritin in the uh, 1000 uh, and um, uh, folic acid was normal. I do have the- Oh yeah, I left this patient's febrile. Now I'm going back. I'm like, why is that ferritin high? So I, I completely missed the fact that this patient has a fever uh, 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 um, and um, that does change. So let me go Let me go back a little bit. So that ferritin, I was like, why is the ferritin a thousand? And now I see this. So the patient's inflamed from something. And seeing that ferritin and that pancytopenia and that fever, you know, things that I, I left out, you know, either they have a, a coexisting infection uh, um, or they have, um, I don't know, you, you know, I hate to go down this path. Uh, 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 we don't have LFTs back yet, uh, but like an HLH like picture, uh, which can be from, that's a whole talk in itself if we talk about HLH, uh, uh, but fevers, pancytopenia, that's already a few of the HLH uh, like criteria or just some bad lymphoma, uh, uh, very bad lymphoma uh, with inflammatory symptoms, marrow replacement could, could cause some of those things. Um, I'm hoping this isn't some case of some disseminated fungal or TB or whatever. Uh, I wouldn't have much to add for that, but uh, I guess that would also be in my differential. Again, a marrow is going to tell a lot. And I do want to see the the liver panel. Oh, you gave me the liver. So the liver is normal. So that makes HLH a little bit less likely. The creatinine's elevated. Uh, um, and that it would be really weird for creatinine of 2.1 to cause this degree of cytopenia. Uh, um, so th those are some other thoughts. Righty. Did they so get an LDH? The LDH is elevated. Um, like very elevated or just a little? Let me take a look here because I don't have it. It's in the 500. How high? 500. That's pretty good. Right, so elevated LDH, you think of either cell turnover, so hemolysis, but to my now, I'm looking at this, right? This patient has no other evidence of hemolysis right there. Billy's normal, so they don't have a high indirect bilirubin, and their retic was low. So high LDH, you think of high cell turnover uh, um, from something bad, okay? Uh, whether it's in the lungs, whether it's cancer, so, so something bad's going on. 500 is is not a, uh, depending on the units, uh, that's, that's a legitimately elevated LDH. So and I do, I do have uh, the images from the uh, smear and from the bone marrow oh. that I wanted to share them. Um, well, let's make this fun. I mean, should we try to figure out what this is before I look at that stuff? I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I actually wanted to kind of um, before we um, get those amazing images from Gabriel. You know, you. You identified that there's, you know, pancytopenia here and would love to hear you kind of talk through your approach to pancytopenia and how that's influenced by this elevated um, LDH, the ferritin at all. How, how do you, how are you thinking through the, the pancytopenia? Yeah, I mean, so pancytopenia, um, right? If you see someone who's pancytopenic, their, their factory is not working, okay? So their factory is their bone marrow, okay? And why is the factory not working? Um, there's really only a few broad categories, uh, um, and the few broad categories uh, uh, um, are um, you have a primary bone marrow cancer, so like leukemias, myelodysplastic syndromes, okay, um, and uh, uh, or it's being replaced uh, by cancer or infection or sarcoid, you know, uh, or fungus, uh, you know. Cancers that go to the bone marrow, lymphomas, okay? Um, you can see occasionally breast cancer, lung cancer. Those would be more unusual, uh, 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 um, but but it's being replaced. Or it, or there's some severe lack of nutrient. And, and again, like I can't, I mean, it's very unusual, but possible where you see severe B12 deficiency or severe alcoholism, especially in the combination of cirrhosis where you can see severe pancytopenia. Uh, uh, um and then uh, autoimmune attack, like aplastic anemia. And a marrow sorts that out, okay? And like, you know, I left out all of liver disease, but like if the patient has a massive spleen, you know, from cirrhosis or from any form of portal hypertension, that can also cause severe pancytopenia too. So that's that's the one that's not really associated with marrow dysfunction. Um, but yeah, with this patient, um, with an elevated LDH, uh, pancytopenia and fevers, if I had to 
fight to go for it right now. Uh, um, and I'm not, I don't mind being wrong. I don't care. I would say this patient has some sort of uh, uh, aggressive lymphoma uh, uh, um, that's replacing the bone marrow and, and causing these things. That would be my, 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 my gestalt right now. Could be completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. I, I you know, uh, did the, you didn't left out their exam, but whether I'm assuming you would have told me if there was lymph nodes or something else on exam, none of that. Okay. So that, that's what I would say it is right now. I don't think it's HLH uh, 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 with a normal liver, although I guess it's possible, all those things. Okay. Oh yeah. So someone said uric acid. That's not a bad idea. I mean, right. The LDH and uh, uh, creatinine's high. So right. Uh, uh, spontaneous tumor lysis. I would expect a higher LDH uh, if it was that bad of uh, a tumor lysis to cause uh, a kidney uh, dysfunction, but it's possible. So uh, yeah. did you get a uric acid? Five. What? Five. So yeah, that's, like, that, that's right on the impressive. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, so what I would do to work this patient up is they, I, they almost certainly are getting some sort of imaging. Uh, 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 um, I, you know, they probably, at least in my hospital, before they even saw me, would have been pan scans. But that, that, you know, you don't necessarily need to do that yet. Uh, they, they, they need a bone marrow, um, and, you know, right. I, I need to at least make sure. Right, this is new. I'm assuming renal failure, so I, I need to. They need a urine analysis. Uh, uh, um. They need at least uh, uh, some sort of imaging to prove we're not obstructing both ureters, which you can see in aggressive lymphomas causing uh, ureteral obstruction. So those types of things would need to be done on admission to my service, and we would arrange for a bone marrow. While I'm waiting, uh, they'd be getting fluids just for the hell of it, and uh, we would be culturing them to make sure I'm not missing some infection. At this point, I probably wouldn't have actually started empiric antibiotics. They're not neutropenic. They're stable, uh, but I would have a low threshold to do that. So that, that's what I would have done if they were admitted to me. Do you want a urine? Yeah, I mean, I, they're in new renal failure. Well, we don't know. So yeah, I, I do. I want to know if there's protein in the urine or, or, or what's the urine analysis show anything? Uh, three grams, three, 3.5 grams of protein in the okay, urine. Okay, so um, that's a 24-hour urine uh, that was gotten. So I'm assuming the UA showed a, a, a lot of protein. So, ah, God. Okay, so it's not quite, I think, nephrotic syndrome yet, but close to it. Uh, I forget the exact gram cut off, but that's significant proteinuria. Um, so in the setting of proteinuria, uh, 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 I mean, this could, this could be bad myeloma, uh, it'd be real bad myeloma, uh, um, with proteinuria, right? You see renal, I, the calcium I'm assuming was normal, or you would have told me was the nine. calcium. What? Nine, nine. Yeah. So not too bad. What was the total protein in albumin? Uh, albumin is 3.1. Was the total protein elevated? Uh, it was elevated. 5.3, I don't have it like this. I mean, I, I would be, you know, again, we're going to be getting a marrow, but I, I probably at this point also would have gotten uh, 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 an SPEP immunofixation and, and, and light chains. Because uh, uh, right with proteinuria uh, um, and um, and some imaging might have shown us, lytic, again, all this stuff's happening at once, but that's also on my differential. So do we have an SPEP and in, in, in immunofixation? Was that done? So actually, this was a consult to benign hematology initially. Oh. Uh, so that was not, uh, that was ordered, but after we went through the smear first. Okay, so we can do the smear first. So the smear. I can't. Let me see if I have it. I do have the smear here. Uh, how do I? Are you guys seeing it? Yep, we are seeing it. Okay, let me see if I can increase this. Yeah, so this was the smear. It's hard to, I mean, it's clearly anemic. I can't really see, I mean, there's that one cell in the center. It's hard for me to see it uh, uh, at this magnification. I mean, I see, I actually see, you know, so you, I see polychromasia, like the RBCs are all a bunch of different sizes. You see some kind of elliptocytes or pencil-like cells. Some are more hypochromic than other. Uh, so I don't know if the patient had a transfusion after the smear because some are much more red than others. Uh, you can see that in the RBCs. And I, I, I cannot, there's one cell in the center. I can't really tell you what it is. It's hard. I'm trying to zoom in. Um, I'm unable. Uh, it's like a band. It's like a, a band or yeah, I think it's a neutrophil. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's not quite segmented off. So it looks like a, I'm zooming in right now on my thing. 
Yeah, it just looks like a band. I don't see any rouleau, which you could sometimes see with myeloma. So it's not really, I don't know, it's not super helpful. I don't, you know, uh, um, unless I'm missing something. Well, maybe a few. Let me see here. I'm trying to see if I see any pencil-like cells. Yeah, I mean, there's a few cells that have like a little tip, like a, a, a you know, teardrop. A, a, a few that I see. So decryocytes. Uh, um, but I can't give you a diagnosis based off the blood smear. And Aaron, just a uh, quick question here. So you mentioned the potential concern of myeloma given some of the lab findings. Could you um, clarify for all of us how you make the diagnosis of myeloma, what those criteria are? Yeah, um, again, you know, usually all this stuff in, in, in clinical practice come back pretty fast, especially when they're hospitalized. But yeah, so, you know, so multiple myeloma, it's a cancer of the plasma cells. So that's the terminal stage of B cell differentiation. So, right, the B cell grows up in the bone marrow, leaves, goes to the lymph node. And then after it goes to the lymph node germinal center, it becomes a plasma cell. Plasma cells secrete antibodies. So it's a cancer of those antibodies producing plasma cells. Myeloma typically presents with, you know, what we call crab criteria, not all of it, but some of it or all of it. So hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, that's usually normal cytic to macrocytic in bone disease, lytic, lytic bone lesions. And so the diagnosis of myeloma, you need to, not to get into the weeds, uh, but at least a decade ago, you needed some of the crab criteria uh, um, plus 10% uh, or more clonal plasma cells uh, in the bone marrow. And typically if they have full-blown myeloma, the bone marrow is packed full of plasma cells, like 60, 70, 80%. And these cancer plasma cells these cancer plasma cells. Uh, oh, I see someone say teardrop cells, myelofibrosis. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would say that with myelofibrosis, I would expect some splenomegaly on exam. And typically, you can get pancytopenia, but a lot of times you actually see uh, thrombocytosis and so in in a, in a neutrophilia, some more inflammatory symptoms. But um, but that's a good thought with with myelofibrosis. So back to myeloma. Um, so these, these malignant plasma cells still retain the ability to secrete aminoglobulin, but now you have a clone uh, of plasma cells secreting the same aminoglobulin. So blood laboratory blood work, so an SPEP, a serum protein electrophoresis, can detect a monoclonal spike, a monoclonal aminoglobulin. Uh, so typically there should be a smooth distribution of aminoglobulins based off their charge, because right, uh, aminoglobulins are proteins made of amino acids. Amino acids have charges, at least some of them. If you have a monoclonal spike, you'll see one particular spike on an SPEP. And then the amino fixation will qualify it. It will tell you the flavor of that antibody, whether it's IgG, A, E, D, M. And then the um, light chain, if you have a monoclonal population, antibodies either come in kappa or lambda light chains or just light chains themselves. They don't have a heavy chain and you would see a skew in the ratio. So like, Right, if this patient, if you gave me a capital lambda ratio that was, you know, over 50, 100 to 1, I think it'd be slam dunk, this is going to be myeloma, or with an S-PEP of, with an M-spike of 4 grams per deciliter. But if you gave me an M-spike of 0.2 grams per deciliter, no, I'm not calling it myeloma without a bone marrow showing me a lot of plasma cells. Because, right, anyone over the age of 50, you have at least a 3 to 4% chance of having a monoclonal protein in your blood, MGUS. As you get older, that, that frequency increases. Amazing teaching. Thank you. And just one follow-up question um, to the, the kappa and lambda ratio. Could you explain kind of what is a normal ratio and at what point the ratio uh, becomes concerning? Yeah. So um, with kappa lambdas, um, right in the bone marrow, your B cells, they undergo kappa rearrangement first. Remember back to med school immunology, they rearrange kappa first. And if that's unsuccessful, you'll then get lambda rearrangement. So the normal ratio, it's anywhere between like about 0.5 and one and a half. You know, I just say, remember one. It should be close to one. They should be even amounts. Um, and as I said, if it gets skewed uh, in one direction, so if it gets really tiny, lambda, if it gets high, kappa, you start thinking of clonal plasma cell processes, which is a whole talk in itself. There's many of them. Myeloma being the most notable. Don't forget, though, with chronic kidney disease, and um, as your GFR decreases, and remember, we tend to order a lot of kappa lambdas in patients with decreased renal function because- we're trying to look for the cause of the uh, of the renal disease. Uh, um, but most of the time when you order a capital lambda renal disease, the elevated kappa light chain is not the cause of the renal disease. It's a result. So your body, your kidneys filter uh, uh, your kappa and they filter kappa lambda slightly different. Um, and just trust me, as you go into renal failure, your kappa lambda ratio gets skewed in the kappa direction. 
And I, I, I don't even have that memorized. I always, there's an up to date. You can quickly Google it. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, if your GFR is less than 30 and you see a capital lambda ratio of like five or eight that's elevated, that's not, some, not something to write home about. So just remember that as the kidney function goes down, you'll see a skew towards the kappa direction. Amazing. Thank you. All right, Gabriel, what happened next? Okay. So we got the bone marrow, which showed this. Yeah, I'm not the greatest with, uh, I'm better with flows. Um, if you had a, a flow cytometry, I mean, a I lot of that, yeah. So it's so, not, what I can tell you this is it's right. So if this was aplastic anemia, it would be empty. It, it is not empty. It is packed full of cells. Okay. Um, you can see that there's a lot of stuff in there. Okay. Uh, um, so there's some cellular process uh, that's causing this, this badness. And I'm trying to zoom in. I, I can't tell you what that cell is from, from, from that image. Yeah, so these are plasma cells, I think. Let me see here. Uh, um, this is the aspirate, just. Uh... Yeah, so this these these look like plasma cells. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, we can get the flow would tell me in a second, but I th these look like plasma cells because they have, um, as you can see, a lot of cytoplasm, and then they have around that nucleus. If you look. First of all, and some of these have nucleoli, so they're scary looking plasma cells. And further, if you look around the nucleus, and I'm pointing with my pointer, but you can't see that, it kind of, there's this clearing around the nucleus, and that's the Golgi apparatus. Uh, and right, plasma cells uh, make a lot of protein, so they need a lot of Golgi. So that's called a perinuclear like halo that you'll sometimes see with plasma cells. So I, so right now I would say this patient has plasma cell myeloma, would be my guess uh, 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 with uh, uh would be my guess. And if that total protein was only five, I would expect it to be a little higher. Maybe it's just a light chain myeloma, but we'll, we'll find out. So I what would you back. do next? So what well, I, I mean, next... I need to, I need to confirm it. Some others should be flow. I need a light chain and then a monoclonal protein. So once you tell me that, I'll tell you what I would do next. Okay. So Kappa Lambda, Kappa was 11.8. Let me leave here. So then you can guys. Start to get it again. So kappa was uh eleven point eight, lambda was twelve thousand nine hundred and thirty. Yeah. Okay. So this. Yeah. And again, I'm in real life. You know, hopefully I would have checked it with the anemia and kidney disease. That would have come back. And we would have been done. I wouldn't have even waited for the bone marrow to start dealing with this patient. Okay. Uh, cause the bone marrow is going to take three to sometimes a week. Okay. So in real life, we would have gotten that back and that's a super high, um, um, uh, a Lambda light chain. Uh, typically when you start saying over 500 is where you start worrying about past nephropathy, which is likely what this patient is suffering from. Now it's more complicated than that because kidney disease in, 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 in myeloma, um, the classic is cast nephropathy from a high light chain burden that combines with that TAM horse fall, whatever that freaking protein is called, and then coalesces in the distal tubules of the nephron and causes destruction. And you would see a huge amount of proteinuria, okay? But on your urinalysis, which you didn't give, but the urinalysis would usually shows glands, okay? Right? The urinalysis detects albumin, okay? It does not detect cast nephropathy, which is not albumin, it's light chains, Okay. So the classic thing, at least on a heme board, is you would see a, a normal UA and you blew it because you didn't check the 24-hour or spot protein, okay? You need a, I you typically just get a spot protein, but this was a 24-hour urine protein, it's 3.5 grams per deciliter. And that's how you'll pick up cast nephropathy. Now, you can also see with plasma cell problems, you can see amyloid, which is typically lambda light chain, and that deposits in the glomerulus, okay? And if the glomerulus is effed up, sorry, excuse me, if the glomerulus is screwed up, you'll see albuminuria, right? The albumin gets through and your UA will be floridly positive and you'll see a high total protein, okay? Uh, uh, um, there's also light chain deposition disease, which is not amyloid. It's just that the light chain is deposited in the glomerulus at a slightly different configuration. And there you'll also see albuminuria. And then there's all these, I won't go into detail, all these other monoclonal gammopathies of renal significance that typically cause an elevated albumin. But I suspect with a light chain of 12,000, um, I wouldn't even do a kidney biopsy. Uh, I think this is cast nephropathy, uh, um, almost certainly. And how would I treat the cast nephropathy? You know, the, 
and this would be happening on day one, even before my marrow's back. This patient has myeloma, okay? I, I, I We usually don't do, I, we don't at our center. Some centers where they'll actually freeze off the, the light chains, okay? Like you call nephrology and they filter off the light chains. Um, we don't do much of that anymore. I guess it's not unreasonable to do in this particular scenario. Clearly there's no randomized data uh, um, and you'll never have that. And the kidneys are pretty important. But typically what I would do is I would hydrate them and start them immediately on dexamethasone. Uh, typically, before we had any myeloma drugs, the, the only thing we treated myeloma with was dexamethasone. So they would get 40 milligrams for four days, uh, uh, pretty high doses. I would also start them on uh, Velcade, which is bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor. It's perfectly safe to give in patients with renal dysfunction, uh, unlike some other myeloma drugs. And that will start rapidly lowering the light chains. And in the era of 2024, um, these patients within a day, at least at our hospital, would also get a dose of daratumumab, which is a monoclonal antibody to CD38. And we don't do this. If they were stable myeloma, I would discharge them. They could treat it outpatient. But this is not stable myeloma with a light chain of 12,000 and, and uh, uh, going into renal failure. They would get daratumumab because I need to get that light chain as low as possible, as fast as possible to save the kidneys. So that's what they would would, would get. Um, they, I, I would not, uh, um, the calcium was normal. So you can also see renal failure with hypercalcemia, right? Hypercalcemia causes a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, uh, excuse me, a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Um, and the treatment for that is, you know, uh, bisphosphonates and fluids. This patient does not need bisphosphonates. Actually, I would avoid uh, the bisphosphonates. I see someone I say, would I add cytoxin? A few years ago, I would have. Um, we used to treat these patients with Cyborg D. They actually did a randomized study Again, not at the level of a resident or even fellow, I would suspect you know this, of Cyborg D versus Velcade Dex in the setting of acute renal failure. And it, it wasn't beneficial uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in that study. Uh, and now with Daratumab, I would, I would not. Granted, Daratumab is way more expensive. So they I would hold off on the... That, that's what I would do immediately. And then we'd work them up. They'd get their bone marrow. They'd probably sit on our service for a few days. We'd watch their light chains go down, their kidney function stabilize, and then I would discharge them and treat them outpatient, okay? Um, in this particular individual, just with a lambda light chain and renal failure, I would probably also get an echocardiogram just to make sure we're not missing, you know, a, a cardiomyopathy that would be consistent with coexisting amyloid, plus or minus a fat pad biopsy. I would not get, though, a, a renal biopsy at this point. And, we didn't and then that. outpatient, they would get better, and we would... Uh, Either uh, I would it, then as an outpatient, uh, Revlimid would be added. Revlimid is le lenalidomide, uh, an immunomodulator. Lenalidomide you can give with renal dysfunction, but you have to dose reduce. And in a newly diagnosed patient with a rapidly fluctuating GFR, we hold the lenalidomide because we don't know what way things are going to go. And then as an outpatient, that drug would be added when we have a, a stable uh, a renal function. That's how we'd fix them. Some points. Uh, or, that or I, I, so the bone marrow came with 92% plasma cells. Um, the I, IgA was 24 low. The IgG was 600, also low. And the IgM were, was also low. Yeah, like this is light chain myeloma, which is why when I said the total protein was low, which is why I suspected total protein will sometimes miss the free light chains. Don't ask me why. That's why I suspected this was a light chain myeloma. So just, you know, you can, that's why the light chain ratio is so important. And the SPEP could be actually negative and miss it completely, uh, um, uh, which is why you need to get the capital lambda ratio. And, and any patient you're truly concerned with a plasma cell related process. Now I argue we overorder that test, but if you truly are concerned, you need to order everything, which is an SPEP amino fixation and a light chain. You actually really don't even need to order it on the urine. You need to get a urine protein but you don't need to actually, I don't, I rarely ever get the amino fixation or light chains on the urine itself. What I care about in the urine is, is there proteinuria for the reasons we discussed earlier? And uh, Aaron, if you could talk, you, you spoke a, a lot about uh, the medications that you would treat initially a patient with uh, multiple myeloma. I think it would be interesting to know uh, like one or two most common side effects from these medications that sometimes they uh, appear in in clinics when they are like coming over for primary care and, or in the ED and 
complain. Yeah, and again, not to go out of scope, but a young patient like this in today's era would be treated with daratumumab, lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. So that's called a quad, okay? A, a, a few years back, they would have been treated with just lenalidomide, uh, uh, um, velcade, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, or cytoxin, uh, velcade, dexamethasone. But I think someone like this probably would be treated with all four. And so we'll go over it because it actually includes all major classes of myeloma drugs. So daratumumab is a monoclonal antibody. It's actually a good drug. Um, it, 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 um, it's given, it used to be given IV. It's now given subcutaneously. And the risk of infusion reaction subcutaneously is way lower. It suppresses your immune system. So there's more URIs, infections, but not greatly. Um, it doesn't lower your blood counts. Um, something to know about you. We always have to notify our blood bank if daratumumab is ordered. Daratumumab pan binds red blood cells. CD38 is expressed on all red blood cells. So it causes like pan reaction with everything in the blood bank. And it's not real. These aren't auto or allo antibodies. It's, it's artificial from the daratumumab. If you, you need to notify the blood bank so they're aware of this and they have sophisticated testing to get around that. So uh, um, in most cancer centers, it's the blood bank knows, but I can understand if they got a type and screen somewhere else, they might not. Um, the other thing with daratumumab, it's not a side effect, um, but right, daratumumab is a monoclonal protein. So when you order an SPEP and immunofixation, you'll detect it. And so like I've seen patients like, you know, if they're, if they're a light chain myeloma and all of a sudden have an IgG kappa on their immunofixation, that's the daratumumab. It's an IgG kappa. So it's, it's typical to see these patients have very low M spikes while they're on daratumumab. Uh, the next drug, bortezomib, which we also call Velcade, it's given subcutaneously. Um, it is, it slightly lowers the blood counts. That's not a main issue with the drug. Um, the biggest issues are um, neuropathy. Okay. So they get a horrible peripheral neuropathy on the drug more pronounced in older individuals. It's typically sensory, but it can be motor. It can even be autonomic. I, I've seen people with you know orthostatic hypotension from it. And it's dose dependent. So it's typically after many cycles. Um, and neuropathy sucks. Once it happens, it's very hard to fix. Uh, we don't have many great drugs for it. I think we're all familiar with those patients coming to our clinic and offering gabapentin without much success. Um, so it's best to prevent that, uh, which is why there's actually a push in the field to use less uh, bortezomib, although it is very cheap. The other main side effect of bortezomib is um, diarrhea. It's typically for a day or two after the shot, um, they can get a pretty bad diarrhea, okay? Uh, lenalidomide, otherwise known as Revlimid, um, it's a drug we use in all sorts of cancers. It's a very good drug. Um, it, uh, it's an immunomodulatory drug, so it suppresses your immune system, but it actually also stimulates your immune system. And um, that's the drug that is myelosuppressive, so neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia. Um, it's typically not horrible, but you can sometimes see some pretty severe myelosuppression where you have to hold the drug. It is very thrombogenic, so VTE, especially when combined with dexamethasone uh, at high doses. And so all patients uh, uh, who are getting this drug, they also have cancer. So they have like every freaking risk factor known to God for thromboembolism. So most patients need at least aspirin. There are nomograms or scoring systems to decide if you need to actually give them a DOAC. I won't get into the minutia of that, but all these patients are usually on at least aspirin, 81. Um, and then Revlimid in about 10% to 20% can cause a pretty bad rash. So it's, uh, we see them, so if it's just mild, we tell them to ignore it or give topicals. But if it's a full body rash, we hold the drug. We still re-challenge because it's such an important drug. Um, um, but um, if the rash happens severe twice, then we, we give it up. Fatigue on lenalidomide, people, we tell them to take it at night. People get real tired. People, after a while, being on Lennon, I just feel like shit, you know, so we eventually stop it. Uh, um, and I, uh, the secondary malignancy risk is real with lenalidomide. It's only a few percent, but it's real. And there's definitely an increased risk of skin cancers, acute myeloid leukemia, ALL, um, um, that is a bummer when it happens. It's not a reason not to give the drug, but you definitely have to tell the patient that they're at risk for that. I'm trying to think of, oh, I left out with uh, bortezomib. Don't stop the acyclovir. I've seen that's happened to my, we put them all on acyclovir because the risk of shingles reactivation with uh, Valcade bortezomib is very high. So that's why they're on the acyclovir. It does prevent it. So keep them on it, okay? Uh, um, and I think those are most of the main side effects for those. And then all together, they all cause immunosuppression. So like patients on quad therapy, you know, there's a 10 to 15% emission for febrile neutropenia, pneumonia, things like that.
Oh, Dara, uh, I saw some with Dara. To be honest, people give acyclovir with Dara, but if they're on Dara without the Velcade, they really don't need it. I went back and looked at this data one time and the risk with Dara without the Velcade is marginal, if anything. Typically though, they're on Velcade, so you give the acyclovir. Um, there was just a randomized study um, for myeloma where they gave levofloxacin to all patients getting induction therapy. The induction regimens were slightly different than what we use now. And they reported quite a high risk rate of, I mean, it's, I, I give it to a lot of myeloma. I don't have many patients during induction getting admitted for a bad infection. Uh, but some doctors do put their patients on levofloxacin and prophylaxis. Um, Bactrim, I typically don't use uh, in newly diagnosed patients. Uh, that's reserved for later lines for patients getting CAR T's and bispecific type therapies where they're really much more immunosuppressed. Truly a masterclass of the, the treatments and, and side effects. So thank you. Gabriel, how did this patient do and what treatment did they get? Yeah, well, they ended up getting the uh, the Daris uh, Cyborg initially because of the kidney uh, because of his uh, her the kidney kidney function started to deteriorate unfortunately so and then we started uh their cyborg uh the patient initially improved a little bit and then uh worsened they had to make some changes eventually the patient was discharged stayed for some time uh un in remission had several uh, lines of therapy until uh, with the fourth line of therapy, patient ended up getting uh, uh, CAR T cell uh, transplant, CAR T cell therapy, uh, which was the interesting, uh, another interesting part. Um, yeah, and some 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 other facts that I did mention on fish uh, of the of this patient, uh, there was like translocation four fourteen, translocation eleven fourteen, translocation fourteen sixteen, and deletion uh, in TP fifty three. Yes, yeah, so this is crap myeloma. So that would be a triple hit. So four fourteen. Uh, uh, 14, 16, and deletion 17P. The 11, 14 is actually not a bad risk, but those other three ones are horrible, which is why she presented this way and sounds like progressed quite rapidly through all of her other therapies. So that's a, it's a real bad myeloma this patient has or had. Yeah, I don't well, think you know the translocations, but, you know, yeah, I mean, typically my, you know, risk stratification in myeloma, which we didn't talk about, traditionally it's based off um, the ISSS, which is the uh, uh, albumin, so if it's low, the beta-2 microglobulin. And then they added in cytogenetic abnormalities, which they keep on adding everyday new ones. Um, but uh, uh, 414, uh, uh, 1416, 1420, deletion 17P, gain of 1Q, deletion 1P. Those are the the, the bad ones. Um, so, um, And the more of those you have, the worse you are. But I argue you didn't even need to know that. You could tell that this was a bad actor myeloma presenting with renal failure and a light chain of 12,000. Well, I worked coming up at that hour. So Gary, I really wanted to to thank you for presenting this case that was really rich with, um, you know, educational points. And Aaron, thank you so much for your wonderful teaching. Before yeah. we end, Aaron, I'm wondering if you could highlight, you know, three key warning points that you want um, learners listening to this to take away. Ooh, that's a tough one. So what is the majority of my audience? Medical students, residents, or fellows? Uh, you could say residents. We say residents is the majority, but uh, the whole spectrum. Yeah, so residents. Um, I would say whenever you're seeing someone with a cytopenia, do they have more than one cytopenia? <laughs> if they have more than one cytopenia, uh, it's almost always, for the most part, marrow disorders. Now, uh, uh, leaving out like, TTP and those types of things where there's anemia and thrombocytopenia. Uh, but if there's anemia and myeloleukopenia, you got to start thinking about the marrow. And typically at that point, you should probably call a hematologist uh, um, and you can order your nutritional studies and viral serologies, which are important. We need to know if they have HIV, FC, but that's usually not going to clinch the diagnosis. They're going to need a bone marrow. Uh, point number two, know your CRAB criteria. 
hypercalcemia, renal disease, anemia, lytic bone disease. Whenever you see more than one of those things uh, together, you need to think myeloma. And even without a bone marrow, you can usually clinch the diagnosis just with three simple four, right? You need to order the SPEP, which quantifies the M spike. You need to order the immunofixation, which qualifies the M spike. What flavor is it? IgG, A, D, M, or E, or D. And then you need to order a light chain. As we've pointed out, you can have normal of those other things and have a horrifically elevated light chain. And you need to look for proteinuria. And we discussed, right, proteinuria, I typically just get a spot, but if you're in the hospital, you can get a 24 hour. In the urinalysis, which I won't repeat, you can look for, right, you can, a UA can be normal and you can still have a shit ton of proteinuria from cast nephropathy. Okay, so that's point two. Point three, um, I, uh, We'll talk, so myeloma, um, I think this is important to know. Myeloma could present sick as hell, uh, um, but patients can live over a decade, if not longer, uh, largely out of the hospital. And it's like, you know, I'm critical of myeloma on my Twitter feed, but taking care of the patients is very rewarding. I have some, you know, I, I have patients decades out uh, that I see every, you know, six months doing really well. So it's a very treatable uh, malignancy, not curable, but a livable chronic disease for many. Beautiful teaching points. Thank you so much for, for distilling those at the end for us. Yeah. All right. Well, we're at the hour, so we will end the session here. But Aaron, Gabriel, thank you so much for your wonderful teaching. Um, Gabriel, really a wonderful case to learn from. So thank you again for um, for presenting it. Um, Anmol, thank you for scribing the, teach the teaching points. And Gia, thank you so much for scribing. All yeah. right. We'll end the session here. But thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.